good evening and welcome to our first program of our season and of our new year. So to everybody, I want to wish you a really good and healthy new year. We all need it. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, and tonight we launch our 28th season. <laughs> Thank you. Talk about panic and anxiety. Anyway, I'm so delighted to be here in this most amazing, gorgeous room at the Abel, which is a membership-based center built by and for women over 100 years ago. They, they host great programs of their own, and they're great to Writer's Block and to me. So they give me a really good deal because I say this spiel, but I actually really mean it. So, um, and they're watching because they're here tonight. Uh, consider joining if they accepted me as a member. The bar is pretty low and have no fear of applying yourself. Um, now for tonight. Matt Gutman is in almost every way the perfect TV guy. He's a terrific journalist, the perfect hard-hitting correspondent. He's fast on his feet. He's really handsome. He's so smart. And what else do you need? Anyway, can you imagine... <laughs> can you imagine being thrown into a natural disaster, holding a microphone and being filmed and simultaneously suffering from a panic attack? Can you imagine covering international conflict where your own safety is thrown into great danger, all while holding a microphone and being filmed and simultaneously suffering from a panic attack? He pulled through his panic until one day when he didn't. Then he tackled his syndrome full throttle, met with a panoply of doctors, charlatans, scientists, and more oddballs than I could name, and I loved, I loved those guys. He tries everything in his search. In his new book, No Time to Panic, Mac takes us through this journey to wellness. I loved it. I cringed a thousand times, I winced a thousand times more, and I laughed a lot. I learned a tremendous amount, which I want to apply, apply to my everyday life, too. Mayim Bialik has too many talents for any one room. She's a neuroscientist with a doctorate from UCLA, and in her spare time, she starred in a groundbreaking and award-winning sitcom, The Big Bang Theory, and she hosts a podcast that is just, you know, hugely, hugely influential. Um, Mayim Bialik's breakdown is wildly popular and immensely respected, not only by listeners, but scientists, academics, and doctors. She's also widely respected for those days on Jeopardy. So, had to say it. <laughs> Matt and Mayim will chat. When they're through, Matt will sign copies of No Time to Panic. And some of you actually came in with some, with some other stuff that he can sign. Um, I urge you to read it. It makes a perfect gift for anyone who has ever felt anxious. So, and remember the high holidays are here, so it's, a, it's even a better gift. Um, Matt Gutman, Mayim Bialik, thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Do you have anything you want to say before we get started? I just love the fact that I feel like I know half the people here. I mean, there's such, this is like a hometown crowd. Uh, one quick thing, there are actually two people, three people, at least four, in the crowd who were in the book. So, and forgive me if I'm, Lane Jaffe, Jenny, Elise Lunin, and of course, Daphna. Um, so... Anybody I'm missing? No, but it's kind of interesting. Characters, people who are featured not insignificantly at all in the book. So I'm so grateful that you and all of the rest of these beautiful faces are here today. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. And this is certainly... Uh, I, I grew up in L.A. and have never been to this building. And it's really a, a beautiful venue. And 
Um, it's really lovely to be here, and thank you so much for asking me to be part of this. Um, as Andrea mentioned, uh, I met you through my podcast, which um, just launched today. We timed it so that it would come out um, for your book launch. So um, for those of you who have already heard me and Matt talk, we will talk about some other things tonight, so don't leave just yet. Um, and if you enjoy what we're talking about, obviously, please purchase the book, buy it for others, and um, we're going to get started. So we talked a little about what we're going to talk about, but I have a funny question to ask you. This is a lot of attention, everything going on in your life. It's very exciting. Have you felt an increase in panic leading up to your book release? You know, she goes right for the solar plexus. <laughs> and she did this in the podcast, too. Um, so I, I felt a massive increase in anxiety over the summer. Uh, those, of us who, those of you who spent part of the summer with me might recognize it. Um, it was really bad. Um, and I struggled. I was miserable and I, I you know, was not happy. Uh, and then at some point towards the end of the summer, I was like, okay, let's go back to the basics. I'm going to do the things I know I need to do right now, which is limit caffeine, completely take out alcohol, increase just like regular mindfulness, increase exercise, and it worked. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll, and better. we'll, right, well, I'm glad to hear it. Partly, it was a lot of attention. It, it's, it, it, it's, it's not over like, yet, Matt. No, oh, I know. It's not over. Um, and we will get to some of those things and how you arrived there, but I did want to ask it because I was just so curious. Um, before we kind of get into the book and how you decided to write the book, why, and sort of how you went about it, um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about where anxiety falls on the panic spectrum and where panic disorder sort of becomes its own entity separate from anxiety. As we talked about um, on, on the podcast, and one of the things I talk about a lot on the podcast, a lot of people often don't know the nomenclature for these things, and many people feel anxious and crappy and say, I'm having a panic attack. But as your book describes, there's a very specific physiological difference between anxiety attacks and panic attacks. I wonder if you can talk a bit about the symptoms and what, what panic disorder actually looks and feels like. Did anybody watch Barbie? All right. Remember the line about anxiety? What do they say? They're walking down the beach. Do you remember this, Elise? And Barbie says, I feel undirected dread right now. Right? Like... And then someone's, oh, that must be anxiety. So anxiety is that sort of bubbling feeling of undirected dread. Something is scary. Something is making you feel very uncomfortable. Uh, it's this lurking feeling that sort of stays in your gut and makes you feel generally miserable. But you're pretty well able to continue your daily life. Um, and a, a panic attack, and there's only a panic attack, and so it's, they call it panic, is a suite of symptoms that attacks you and cannot be ignored and you can't really continue doing anything else you were doing if you are in the midst of a panic attack. Uh, the symptoms include rapid heart rate, rapid breathing, tunnel vision sweating, trembling derealization, sorry, no more fingers, um, feelings of being trapped, feelings of feeling like you're going to die, chest pain, shoulder pain, um, things that cannot be ignored. And yeah, it's, it's sort of, I call it the orgasm. So if, if it's what, it's what, yeah, no, it's if pleasure, if an orgasm is the sum of all pleasure, a panic attack is the sum of all anxiety. It is the orgasm of anxiety. And it makes you blurt out regrettable things, sometimes want to smoke a cigarette, and leaves you a sweaty mess afterwards. Um, very well said. Um, the, the other feature that I want to mention, which really is a huge component of, of your book, is um, what comes along with, with panic attacks as opposed to anxiety attacks is a very, very critically significant fear that one is going to happen again. And this is not simply the notion of like, oh, that was really unpleasant, I hope that doesn't happen again. With panic disorder, the fear of having a panic attack can bring on a panic attack. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that, 
that sort of spiral, you know, that um, it's really a, a cumulative spiral, right? It kind of compounds upon itself. And maybe that can lead into you talking a bit about your kind of tipping point. I don't want to call it a crisis, but the, the tipping point in your, your career that led to essentially this book. And this is why we have Maya Bialik doing this, because she kept me on track. <laughs> so to finish up her previous question, which she so nicely alluded to in this question is, um, about 28%, so the data is that 28% of Americans would experience, will experience a panic attack in their lifetime. But given the fact that someone like me had suffered years and hundreds of panic attacks without knowing what they are, the likelihood, say the psychologist interviewed in the book, is that it's probably about 50% of Americans that are likely to experience a single panic attack or more in their lifetimes. Now that does not mean that they have panic disorder. Panic disorder is a pervasive continuation of panic attacks, and more importantly, it is the fear of having a panic attack that changes your day-to-day -day life, and that rules certain things that you do and creates avoidance behavior and safety behaviors like not wanting to go on air, or if you're afraid of flying, you don't fly, or if you're afraid of driving on the freeway, you stop taking freeways and go on surface roads and have cold compresses by your side because that's the only way you're able to do Sometimes it. Sometimes people have lucky undies. Or in my case, you have a few pair of uh, lucky underwear in the rotation, uh, which aren't as successful or lucky as you might think. Uh, I, I smoked cigarettes. I showed up to live shots incredibly late. I did calisthenics. I tried to be jovial and friendly and jokey. Um, and those things don't really work because basically when you're preparing for a panic attack by smoking cigarettes, wearing lucky underwear, stretching, doing push-ups before a live shot, um, you're telling your body and your brain to look out, the threat is coming. So I'd been doing this for years, this crazy regimen, and uh, it obviously wasn't working and I was pretty miserable for a long time. And then on January 26, 2020, um, I got a call from another, sorry, there are five people, Bonnie McLean, uh, our bureau chief. What if chief. people want to be anonymous, Matt? There is no anonymity here. When you know, it is, I'm sorry. So Bonnie McLean, she's the best. Straight to the guttural yeah, here. Thank you. Uh, that uh, Kobe Bryant has likely been killed in this helicopter crash 10 miles from where I live. It was Sunday morning, I finished the pancakes, ran out to do it, and during our first live report, I had a panic attack. And um, it was... You know, I, in the book I write it that there are only so many lanes of traffic that a human brain can navigate simultaneously, and mine clearly failed, right? Because subconsciously I'm also thinking about the fact that my father was killed in a plane crash when he was exactly the same age as Kobe, and I was pretty much exactly the same as Gianna, and uh, I'm driving to this crash site, and we went live on air, and uh, I made a catastrophic mistake. And um, I was suspended for a month for it, and I had a reckoning, and Daphna and I talked about it, and she was, my wife Daphna was incredibly supportive. She said, if you need to stop doing TV news, we will change our lifestyle, we will do whatever we need to do. If this makes you miserable, we're going to stop. Um, and we decided that I will find something else to do if I can't figure it out. And this is not the genesis of the book, but the genesis of trying to figure out panic and spending the next three and a half years trying to get to the bottom of it. So I just want to just slow it down for, you know, for new ears here. You were suspended. Like there was a, a specific repercussion from this situation. And you still kind of were trying to figure out what was going on. So what was your explanation? Because, you know, as someone who has experienced a lot of mental health challenges, there's like the things we tell ourselves, right? Like, oh, I was tired, or oh, it was because of this, or what did you tell yourself in that moment? Just like, I messed up? Or were you aware that something deeper needed unearthing? No, I, I thought I was broken. I was pretty sure that something was very wrong with me. And I knew that other people suffered panic. Um, didn't know quite how many, and that is becoming quite apparent as this book is being published even in the first 24 hours. Um, no, I thought that I carried some weird kink in the human genome that made me um, unreliable and that 
was very scary and my fear was losing control. And uh, I lost control. So my worst fear about having a panic attack actually came out, actually happened. And one of the, a terrible eventuality happened. I made a catastrophic mistake and I almost lost my job over it. Um, these were pretty scary things. So what, what the book is that hopefully all of you are holding in your hands, possibly holding in each hand, um, what, what this book is, is um, a very intimate um, exploration of your journey. And what you did is you sort of applied your journalist reporter brain to the problem of you, which, you know, as bravery goes, is pretty high up there. And you went about it as if you were doing a science experiment or a very detailed report on what this thing was. And, you know, the book is very, you know, there's so many moments that are like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a very, there is a, it's not a voyeuristic, you know, kind of cringe experience that you get. But reading this book, it's kind of like, seeing the hardest parts of someone's journey. And I wonder if when you started out, was that, was that sort of how you framed it? Like, I'm just going to like throw it all out there? Or was it really more of an exploration? Because I'm curious as a writer how you chose to approach this storytelling. You know, it took about a year for me to figure out that I was actually going to write a book. Um, so it wasn't until December 4th, 2020, when I had my last full-on sweating through my underpants, panic attack, um, that I carried my shame hangover onto a Southwest flight and, um, and just started talking to the person I sat down next to. And does everybody know what ASMR is? So ASMR is that tingly feeling you get when someone talks a certain way or wraps a gift or does something and it's just this most pleasant. So I've had it all my life. It's it's just the best gift. Show of hands. Anyone else have this reaction, tingly reaction, when people not, whisper or do things like this? So I am incredibly susceptible to it. And I would like... It was actually one of my claim to fame as, as, as a young journalist. If somebody gave me ASMR over the phone, I would just keep talking to them for an hour. <laughs> like, totally random people. I'm like, oh my God, that's so interesting. <laughs> Can you tell me more? Um, <laughs> so... Uh, I thought that watching this woman knit or crochet would give me this ASMR. And so I sat down and we ended up talking and I ended up for some reason being at such a low, and this was a year after I thought I'd actually figured it out, a year after my suspension, that uh, I just told her everything. And so we talked for the whole hour and 25 minutes that we were on the plane together. We're still in touch now. I met her daughter who is a metaphobic and has panic attacks. And then I realized that there is a constituency of more than one here. And when I tried to find panic attack support groups and couldn't pretty much anywhere in the country, I really realized that there's something here. And that's when I decided to write a book, that something has to happen. Um, so to circle back to your question, it's, like, it's the only thing I know how to do. I know how to report. And so I just did what I feel comfortable doing. And that is, I mean, as people who've worked with me know, like, if there is a story, I'm going to throw myself into it with everything that I have. Um, and so if becoming a lab rat is the way to do it, then that's what made sense to me. The thing that, um, that was done for me when I reported panic attacks, I was a teenager when I, um, when I was diagnosed. And, um, you know, the standard thing to do is give medication. And as a teenager, um, you know, and this was many moons ago, it was the 90s, and I believe the psychiatrist was doing the best that she had been trained to do, um, I was put on Xanax, because Xanax will make a lot of things better, um, because it's essentially a downer, you know, it kind of downregulates the system. And um, I, I kind of want to start there, because it's not where your story ended, but um, did you have experience with people saying, like, take these drugs, this is the solution? Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I, when was that? In the, that was in the late 90s, right? That was early 90s. Early 90s. You flatter me. Sorry. <laughs> um, it hasn't changed much. You know, the first, the drug of choice remains Xanax. And it is 
I mean, who, who doesn't love Xanax? It's like the kindest, gentlest, in the beginning, uh, medication that there is, but that's not a solution. And so I, I, I was given, I was prescribed Xanax, and I was prescribed propranolol, and I took Adderall for my ADHD. I took Stratera, which is a non-stimulant um, medication for ADHD. I took GABAs, which are anti-seizure medications. What else was there? Yeah. The what? Oh, there's Prazosin, there's something. Anyway, I basically tried anything that my psychiatrist would give me, and I was sure that there was some magic pill in his prescription pad that would soothe what ached me, uh, and it would cure me of panic. And I was on Paxil, which is an antidepressant for 18 years. But it didn't work. It didn't stop the panic. The Paxil helped with the overarching anxiety, but it also had lots of side effects, and it was time to stop doing that. So I graduated to other things, and the first experience of altered states was with Lane Jaffe. Uh, you can turn around. Let's, let's shame him a little bit. There he is. Hey, Lane, friend from high school, an amazing yogi, amazing breathwork coach. And, you know, the suspension kind of has a way of opening up your schedule. So, you know, on the, he had a class on a weekday. I'm like, sure, I'll come. <laughs> uh, and he had a breathwork class. And um, I dove into it because that's what I do. You know, if Lane says breathe hard, <laughs> I breathe hard, and, and so I, I ended up going to this, like, it was a complete altered state. So if anybody's done breath work before, and holotropic breath work, you get, you know, lobster clawed, and your feet cramp, and you can't move, and you end up in this altered state. And I started crying a lot in this group, and it's something that I had not, I think, ever done. And Lane came, and he you know, grounded me by just holding my legs, not taking me out of that altered state, but sort of letting me know that someone else was there. And that was sort of the start of me thinking, oh, like, I need to go to a different place in my head. I cannot be in my right mind if I want to deal with what's deep in my body, which is this well of grief that I was always so afraid of going into. So, yeah, and I think I, I want to take a pause there because what's so... Um, striking about this journey that you went on, which is, you know, throughout the pages of this book, which I hope you're all holding in your hand. <laughs> what, what you decided to do was, I don't want to say turn away from, you know, traditional Western medicine, um, because for many people that is helpful and we're not here to denigrate that. But what, what you did was you opened a portal to what... I believe, is going to continue to be the, the next wave of, of mental wellness understanding and treatment. And what really struck me about you and your book is that a lot of the things that you decide to dip a toe into, holotropic breathwork is one of them, um, you, you experience Reiki, you know, energy work, in many cases where hands are hovered over you, um, you you discuss ayahuasca. You have a very, very profoundly interesting journey um, with ayahuasca, which is a, a, a traditional medicine. Um, you also talk about ketamine. And, you know, all of these things are, are things that we're not used to. Reporters who are, like, famous for being on network news, those are not the people that, that talk about this. So for, for those of us in alternative circles, in holistic circles, um, you know, the hippies and mystics among us, these are things that, that people have been doing and talking about. And it really was reserved for those kind of fringe, you know, those fringe people. And it was really looked down upon. And I think your book has to be one of the first, if not the first, to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enter a different realm of treatment and, you know, the holotropic breath work, um, for those of you who may not be familiar, um, it's, a, it's a type of breath work that's often used in yogic practices, and it induces a, an altered state. It, it, it is a, a transcendental breath practice. Sessions are usually close to an hour. And um, you're not just hyperventilating. You are, 
you're creating a change in, in oxygen and oxygen distribution, and that's the lobster claws is a blood vessel thing, um, and that does happen. But what you were open to was trying something, again, outside of the realms of what we've been told is the only way to fix things. So I wonder if you can sort of speak to how you opened that portal. I opened the portal because I was so desperate. And when nothing that you're trying is working, and trust me, I really wanted something in that magical prescription pad to work. But when none of it works, then you go for the stuff that's different. Um, and by the way, there are so many people for whom plain old SSRIs have worked miracles for panic. And it has saved their lives and it has enabled them to live happy, content lives. Uh, and they're in the book. And so, like, if that works, I am all for that, for anyone for whom that works. Um, it didn't work for me, so I needed to seek other stuff. Um, I didn't really care what it was. I just wanted it to work. And so I was willing to try anything. And I'm, by the way, of all the things, I'm probably the biggest skeptic of Reiki. Because, like, oh, okay, energy healing. <laughs> but this... This healer in Peru just did things to me that made me cry so intensely that I didn't even know I was capable of it by just touching me. And I thought she was stabbing me with knives or with a ballpoint pen. But, so I, don't, I can't explain it. I just know that it worked. And it opened a portal of pain. It allowed me to cry to excavate this grief in a way I hadn't expected. Um, I can talk about each individual one if you'd like, if you want to like, or if there's some that you, yeah, I if mean, anybody is curious about specific ones, but well, they and, were all. Yeah, and, and more things may come up, you know, in the Q&A, but um, I'm trying to think, you know, I, I actually, before we get into particular modalities, you know, I, I say this is the book of Matt Gutman's body fluids, because <laughs> it's like a lot of tears, he's already mentioned <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> There's like snot, there's like ever sweat, like name it, and Matt Gutman is talking about his fluids, about Underwear, it. there's a but, lot, should we just say it? Do you want to say diarrhea? There's that, also diarrhea, okay. and throw there up, you go. all the things. But you, you've mentioned crying twice, yeah. and um, I do want you to, to speak a little bit about, and you, a little bit, you know, you, you slid over as you were driving to you know, the scene of this helicopter crash, you kind of slid over the fact that you had an early trauma. And, you know, it, it weaves its way throughout the book. But I wonder if you can talk about, I think, I think I'd like you to talk about where grief fits into this journey in the book. I didn't know that grief fit in the beginning. I didn't... Uh... You know, there's always stuff to deal with. And I, you know, I... So my fear, the reason I never went into the grief zone so deeply before this book was because I was scared that if I went in, and I, in my head, I called it the well of grief, that if I fell into that well of grief, I would never be able to claw my way out. What does that look like practically? I'm curious, what did I that I literally mean? have, I envision a well... And it's bottomless, and it's dark, and it's full of pain, and I can't get out of it, and I won't go in it. Um, so, like, in the book, and I, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but basically, like, every time I do a pretty significant psychedelic, there I am, right in the well of grief. And it just took me right there. And, you know, some people, we talked about it, you know, they're like, hey, man, you did uh, 5-MeO-DMT, right? You licked the toad, man. And, uh, you know, it seems like it was a lot of fun doing all these psychedelics, but I was pretty miserable throughout most of them. And, you know, it's like, it's not Hunter S. Thompson in Las Vegas. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, Matt Gutman sitting on a couch with therapists by his side while he's like, <laughs> ugly cry. Uh, in, in Peru, I did something called 5-MeO-DMT, which is a medicine extracted from basically the mucus of a Sonoran desert toad. Mucus. From... There you go. <laughs> and uh, 
it basically, it's a very short acting, very, very powerful psychedelic that rockets you into the cosmos. Um, but I came flopping out of the cosmos very quickly and off the mat and onto the floor already sweating and basically having um, an earth-shattering cathartic experience. And I basically was screaming in this temple in Peru for 35 straight minutes. And maybe I'm like, I'm very troubled and deeply troubled, which I don't think is impossible, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of buried grief in there. But it, I, I, I just, I had to get this stuff out. And I'd never had the opportunity before to do it. And so this medicine like, helped excavate this stuff that I didn't even know was that intense. And, you know, you're, um, this was a retreat. It was like sort of a budget retreat, but it was pretty amazing. And there were 12 other people who had been hearing me scream. And at the end, we all started, like, I started, there were four other people in the room with me who had also done the 5-MeO DMT. And then they're like, I'm going to curse. They're like, one of them said, Matt, can you please shut the fuck up? <laughs> and then, his name is Glenn. And then, like, at the end, we all started laughing and hugging. And then everybody outside started cheering because they knew that I had been through, like, this earth-shattering experience, and they were so massively supportive. And that's sort of the, the theme of this book, that everybody I tell my story to, and everybody who I describe panic to, says they've been sharing their stories too, and they have been so massively supportive, including you. I wonder if you can, can talk a little bit about um, the craziest thing you tried as you explored all these different modalities. And I mean the most outside of your comfort zone. I'm curious which one did you think it is? <laughs> well, I mean the, the frog one is pretty nuts. The, the, the combo yeah. frog, the giant tree frog? Yeah. Oh, so like at, at one point towards the end of my journey, I was so obsessed with getting taking things that would make me feel really, really crappy and that would make me cry, <laughs> that I did something called combo. Anybody heard of combo? No? It's, this is the, the secretions, not the venom. Secretions. Secretions of the giant monkey frog. <laughs> this is found in the Amazon uh, in Central America, the giant monkey frog. And basically, it will cause you to feel like you have the absolute worst stomach virus of your life. But you don't actually, the stomach flu, right? But you don't actually feel anything good or feel anything psychedelic. It's just the flu. So you go in there and uh, they burn holes in your ankles. Slow down, yeah. slow down. <laughs> Tell the people. I'm now sweating. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, please explain. As soon as, he, as soon as he picks up his microphone, I'd like you to explain the, the method of administration of this. So, you're in this, they do it in, in, in Beverly Hills. Uh, Brandy is her name, if any, I forgot her last name. But Brandy uh, takes incense and she burns these three equidistant um, uh, holes in your ankle, and then they blister. And then she scrapes with a knife, she scrapes off the blister and inserts the secretions of the giant tree frog. And so within seconds, you start to really feel nauseated. And she makes you drink a bucket of water beforehand. And then, of course, what do you do with all the water that's inside you? It comes out. Uh, and so you feel horrific. Uh, you get what's called frog face, which is your face puffs up. And they're all, it's a great genre on, uh, on YouTube and stuff. So if you want to like Google frog face from combo, it's actually kind of fun. So people have like their faces go massively puffy. And they look like this. And uh, yeah, and there's no upside. It's just pure pain. And I did it because I'm like, oh, I want to get to that place of crying and misery this, so I can excavate this. You know, I could hire a therapist, but that wasn't working as well. Um, so, yeah, like that's how, where I got to sort of at the end of this journey. That I was willing to try literally anything. Well, and can you please um, 
share kind of what that experience specifically looked like? Because as you said, there's nothing psychedelic about it. It's nothing, it's not that kind of experience, but can you talk about what came from that experience? No, just mostly pain. It really was just kind of mostly suffering. But the, but the idea is a, a purging, correct? Yeah, no, I, I, did we get, the, yeah, there was a lot of purging. So I, yeah, there was a lot of purging. I, I couldn't quite purge as much as I'd hoped, so some of it stayed inside. But rest assured, actually, eventually, the beauty of it is, not to belabor the body fluid stuff, but the, the beauty of doing all of these things is that eventually I found avenues to be able to extricate my pain uh, or grief or whatever it was that was inside by just like forcing myself to cry or forcing myself to feel. Um, and that's success. And that was going to be my next question. You know, you, you go through all of these, you know, incredible experiments, as it were. And, you know, sort of what, what you arrive at, you know, what I was hoping, and as, you know, as I was reading, you know, every page, I was like, he's going to get to the thing. He's going to find the thing. He's going to find that one thing that once you realize it or process it or cry about it, then you're all better. And, you know, the, the beautiful part of this book is it's, it is, it's everybody's story in that you can keep digging and you will keep finding and there are levels of processing. There are levels of growth, you know, the, the realizations you had about the connections with your dad and that, that trauma, that is trauma, you know that led to a shift in your life, but your sort of conclusion, if there is one, is that this is an ongoing process. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about either the disappointment or the expectation around that or what it's sort of been like to be in real time with these experiences behind you and still be on this journey. So Mark Bronstein, who is a... Um a psychiatrist who administered ketamine with me and was incredible, um, said, so he's six foot four and has long red dreadlocks and wears velour track suits. That was my doctor. Um, and he's like, wellness is work, man. And it's true. It's like it never ends. But I think, has anybody found the one thing? Because has anybody found, like seriously, I'm, if, if there is... I would love to hear it, and it, I hope somebody here has found it, but it's impossible because there is no one thing. It is the human condition. We are constantly searching and constantly working on it, um, and it's never quite concluded. And, you know, Ellen Vora, who's another doctor um, who's interviewed in the book, uh, she's a holistic psychiatrist. Um, she said it almost doesn't matter. She's like, just... Crying is so underrated, she said. You know, we need a cultural rebrand over crying, over feeling emotion, over emoting. Um, and so it doesn't matter that we know exactly what it was. Was it my father being killed in a plane crash when I was 12? Was it being held captive by scary secret police in Venezuela, not knowing if I'd ever go home? Was it absorbing the trauma of many, many hundreds of people who are literally having the worst day of their lives? I don't know, and maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but what I do know is that I found avenues to sort of deal with it. Um, none of them is the home run, but all of them are base hits, and they help me enough. I, I know everyone here is going to read the book, and I, I want to leave a little bit open for some mystery, and I also you know, will take some questions in case people have specific um, things that they'd like to ask about. Um, what has been your, your panic pattern? Have you had panic attacks you know, since, let's say, this book went to print? Um, what, what has your experience been? So, uh, I was doing really well for a while. <laughs> and then we publicized that the book is coming out, and I went public with it. And... Uh, a young producer at ABC seconds before GMA, like this is the next morning. So it's, f by the way, so GMA airs at 4 a.m. Pacific time. So f to wake up for GMA, I'm typically up at 2. That's good Morning America. Good Morning America. Good Morning America is one of the shows that we do on ABC. Thank you. And uh, so to wake, I I'm up two hours before. And sometimes if we have to travel, I'm up at 
So, like, I swear, 30 seconds, this poor person was so lovely and sweet. They came up to me. They're like, oh, Matt. 30 seconds till you're hit, Matt. I didn't know you suffer panic attacks. Does it happen all the time or just on air? 25 seconds to your hit, Matt. Um, I, I mean, I, it's just, I, 15 seconds. Because, you know, you would never know that you would actually, that you'd ever suffer a panic attack. 10 seconds. I don't. <laughs> and like, so I had like a mini panic then and another mini panic that week. And I told you about it. Uh, and since then, I've gotten it together. But that was like, it was so intense because suddenly I realized like, I spent all of this time writing this book and I had this blind spot. I didn't anticipate all of the scrutiny that would happen once I announced that the book is written and what it's about, then people would start asking a very legitimate question. You know, oh, I didn't know you suffer from panic. Are you about to have one right now? How about now? Now? Well, that now? sort of brings us full circle to the first question I asked you. Now I'm feeling horrible that I asked you if you feel panicky. Um, but it does sort of, you know, bring us... Um, full circle because, you know, one of the things you mentioned when you talked about this summer, you know, feeling intense leading up to this, and you mentioned a few things, um, you know, this is a, a hard question to ask because whenever anyone is asked, like, what are the things you do? You know, when people ask me that, what I know to be true is I don't do all the things I know I should all the time. I know the things that I could tell you that make me sound like I've really got it together, right? But you mentioned a, a couple things that were very interesting. You mentioned, I think you mentioned sleep, you mentioned caffeine, you mentioned alcohol. Um, can you talk a bit, and the disclaimer is, I know you don't have to do all the things all the time, but I think a lot of people, especially if they're not familiar with what actually can contribute to sort of your baseline being elevated and therefore making you more susceptible to having a panic attack, what are some of the things? Like if you had to say like, what are five things? What are seven things that for you help keep that baseline lower? You know, my, my overarching and overriding philosophy, our philosophy for raising our kids is we just don't want them to grow up to be assholes, right? And that's a way of saying I want them to be kind human beings. And I, like we li I literally did not know, I'd never seen any of my daughter's grades until the sixth grade, until she had to switch schools because I didn't care. I knew she was bright. She was going to be okay. Um, and so we, what I would say is that I would apply that philosophy to ourselves. And one of the things that I write in the book is that it's sort of like the reverse golden rule. Do unto yourself as you would unto others. And so sometimes we're kinder to others than we are to ourselves. Um, so that starts with like, yeah, get sleep. Walk those extra steps. You know you feel better. There is a drug in our system that works so well. It's called serotonin. And you t take like a three-minute walk and you uh, and begin to feel the benefits of serotonin. You work out for half an hour, you get dopamine. It's even better. And this is all in our system. I mean, sorry, you get endorphins. Endorphins are endogenous morphine. The morphine your body creates by itself. So, like, those are really simple things. Uh, this summer when I was feeling anxious, I started putting more decaf in the coffee, cutting some out, having some tea instead. Uh, I only had one cup of coffee today. For me, that's like very little. Um, I cut out alcohol completely. Alcohol is great. It's a wonderful so social lubricant. It's a toxin, though. It's a toxin. And the, the shamans in Peru and all over the world, they use alcohol, but to extract the essence of a plant, to take the thing out. And they say it steals your spirit. Now, I really believe it's a fantastic social lubricant. And I enjoy it sometimes, but I had to cut it out because it also makes me anxious the day after, even if I don't get drunk. So I cut that out. And like, you do these little things, you're mindful about the fact that you're doing something like, I'm enjoying myself right now. I really am. I see these friendly faces and I'm mindful of being in a cool spot in my life. And I'm enjoying like the energy that everybody's giving off. And I'm enjoying taking in the stories that people are sharing with me about their panic. And so I'm trying to be mindful of the moment as well. 
Like, we all know this stuff. You don't need to write a book in order to know this stuff. It's just about the discipline of trying to apply it. Um, there are a million other things as well, but those are like the simplest, freest things you can do. And they're also sprinkled throughout the book. There's a lot of little nuggets of wisdom. Before we open it up uh, for questions, I want to ask you one, one final thing. Um, now that the book is out there, you know, it's got legs, it's walking about, um, what, do you, what are you legitimately, genuinely hoping that people will get? Meaning, these fine people purchased the book, but if they know someone who's struggling, who's having anxiety, who might be experiencing panic, what would you want them to send in the note with the book that they send to that loved one? Thank you so much. No, I mean that because I neglected to say some of the most important things. So thank you for that. Um, so we started out when you asked me, like, what did you feel when you had this panic? Um, and I felt that I was broken. And so the initial search when the book, st before I, there was a book, but when I was like, I need to figure what the hell this thing is, um, was like, okay, so am I a mutant? Am I some like sort of bend in the human genome that isn't working? No. So I, I talked to evolutionary psychologists and psychologists and biologists, and we are designed to be anxious. We are designed to have false alarms. And Randy Nessie, who's an evolutionary psychiatrist, who's the father of that field, said we are engineered, designed to have a thousand, a thousand false alarms, that means a panic attack, so long as we don't have one single missed alarm. You miss an alarm and you're dead or you're kicked out of your group or something cataclysmic happens. A panic attack, you burn 50 calories and you sweat through your underwear. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but a panic attack is, is designed to be so memorable that you don't do whatever it is again. It's your brain sending your body a signal, don't do whatever that is, and we are very naturally inclined to be highly attuned to other people's perception of us because humans gave up musculature and size and speed for brains and for cooperation. Without the cooperation of our fellow humans, we are dead. So I know our parents told us when we were little, don't care what anybody else thinks of you, but we have to. We live in a society. Look how many people there are in this room. We need other people and we have to rely on them. So to some degree, we should care, and it is perfectly natural to have a panic attack. Lots of people have them, and you can get through it. If anybody else has them, they only last. The actual period of panic, which is your brain's assessment of the incoming threat, is 15 to 60 seconds, maybe 80 seconds. But after that, it's anxiety, and all of us deal with anxiety every day. We can totally get through it. It is something that is surmountable, and it's not a death sentence. So write that on a note when you send this book to a loved one. Um, thank you so much, and I'd really love to open this up. I, I, have, I have a mic, and so um, we'd lo I'm gonna hand you mics for the, the questions, and so I'm gonna start with you, David. Thanks. You mentioned a couple of times that you made a mistake when you were on air. I, didn't, I don't think you meant that, you were, that the panic attack was a mistake. Did you make a factual error? Like You said that a couple of times, it confused me. Thank you. Yeah, I made a, a very bad factual error about something related. I can't really talk about caused it. Caused by the panic attack, like you weren't in your right... Caused partly by the panic attack, um, yeah. So I made a reporting error that was bad and um, I mean I don't know what the consequences of it were but it was a bad mistake it was the first and only such mistake I've ever made in 23 years of being a reporter uh, and it happened live on air on a massive breaking news story so it was cataclysmic Well, but I did think it was my fault. I mean, that was the whole part. The, the, the purpose of this book 
the purpose of this journey was not only to stop panics or to figure out what they're about. It was, I didn't know this at the start, but what became is a, a way to absolve myself of the thousand pounds of shame I carried around when I had a panic attack and self-hatred. Uh, and when I talk about conquering panic attacks, it's not because I don't think I'm going to ever have a panic attack again. And it's not because I don't, I think that I'm never going to be anxious again. I am. It's that I now don't hate myself for it. And I don't schlep around that shame everywhere I go. Thank you. Okay. Um, first you and then you. Hi. I'm looking forward to reading the book, but I have yet to um, read it. So I'm wondering, can you go a little bit further back into your childhood? I, my sense is that a lot of this maybe began when your father died. Can you describe a little bit about what you were like as a kid? And were there signs of this um, when you were young? Oh, wow. This is free therapy, people. This is great. <laughs> Tell me about your mother. Um, you know, I was an anxious child. I was. Um, I always had stomach aches when, you know, there were weekend retreats and I had to be without my parents. I hated it. Um, I used to have nightmares and had to go to a psychologist for it because I had a recurring dream about the road in the exact spot that my parents were going to be killed in a fiery wreck over and over and over again when I was like nine, ten. Um, so like I, I am genetically wired for anxiety. Uh, I am probably genetically wired for panic. I'm also genetically wired to be exquisitely sensitive to other people, um, which is one of my gifts in journalism, right? Like I can show up at a scene and I immediately connect with someone and they'll tell me stuff that they don't tell people. Um, and that's, that's my gift, you know. And, and I, I communicate and people and are sometimes, you know, I, I often meet people literally in the worst day of their lives where, where, where their loved one has died or they're just getting over it or they've lost their house or they've been bombed or something. And I'm able to, to speak the, the mutual language of grief and of the afflicted. Um, so, like, it's both a curse and a blessing. Thank you. Hi. You've mentioned something about your childhood. Um, you were diagnosed with ADHD. So you had trauma as young, a diagnosis of ADHD, which manifested itself into your anxiety and that. Do you, through your research, feel that maybe the ADHD was a misdiagnosed and it may have been an early anxiety. And I say that because my son lost his father at three, diagnosed with ADHD in elementary school, got better help when he got the anxiety diagnosis as an adult and treated that way. I'm here for him getting the book. And so just wondering, and I'm a school psychologist, Looking at that ADHD, are we really missing a lot with our kids when there's such a heavy anxiety component to ADHD? Did you see that? So, sorry. But when you were talking about the loss of your father, all I'm doing is hearing about my son and all of that trauma. So, anyway. Thank you for sharing. Um, so, I was never, I was diagnosed, like everybody knew I had ADHD. I was the epitome of hyperactive, right? Uncle David laughing in the background. Uh, yeah, no, so like there was never a question, but my mother never made a deal out of it. Like I wasn't officially diagnosed. This was in the early 80s. They weren't really giving Ritalin yet. And by the time they were, I was kind of over it and I'd learned how to cope. And I, you know, I'd had, Myrna Wasserman told me how to make schedules and, and catalog things and lists. And so, you know, I was massively privileged. Like, my mother did everything she could to help me get through my unbelievable scatteredness and sloppiness. And, you know, 
I was just a child of privilege, so I, did, you know, I don't know. Um, I still deal with it today. Uh, I don't know. It's a tough question. I don't know about the diagnosis, and I'm not a psychologist, or you know, I don't feel comfortable talking about it. Um, I think it's been an asset to me. I mean, I've, I happen to find a vocation that caters to people with short attention spans and who love to bounce from thing to thing and can get really laser focused on something intensely and then it's moving on, <laughs> right? Like it worked for me. So hopefully your son and people like him can find that thing that makes them feel fulfilled uh, and gives them a sense of purpose and that works with someone with, with this condition. If I can just chime in also, Gabor Mate has you know, an entire book dedicated to this topic of ADHD, and there's a, a tremendous amount in there about, I think, what you also indicate in the book, which is there's this, this enormous overlap of chemistry and of complexity, um, and I think that was you know, sort of what I was hoping we would get to, which I think we did, is that there's all these different layers, and there's not always one place to pinpoint, but if there's sort of a cumulative you know, uh, collection. Anyway, sorry. But basically, I had ADHD long before I suffered any significant trauma. And then maybe they compounded afterwards, but I don't know. But I don't think I'm that... Anyway, I don't know. No, but it, I just found it so What's your name? Zena. Zena. I can tell you what, Zena. He's going to be okay because he's got a mother who really loves him. <laughs> and that is the most important thing and we can all tell. Thank you. No, okay. seriously. Okay, I, I'm, um, I've uh, gestured to a few people. This guy, there was somebody over there, oh, that guy over there, this lady here, and you. Okay, and then, thank you. Okay, so <laughs> I think I said you. Thank you. I appreciate it. First of all, I want to thank you so much for writing the book and having this uh, book symposium because it couldn't be better timing for me. Uh, in the past month, uh, I've been in the ER four times trying to figure out why is my, the upper part of my chest tight? What's going on? For, initially, it was my roommate that used this bleach. I, I'm, I'm asthmatic. That's another thing, too. I know you're talking about HDHD, asthmatic, and that triggered it, but it still lasted the tightness of the chest. So it's been a process of elimination for me. I've met with you know, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, cardiologist, going to have a stress test on a Thursday, you know, to see if it's not the heart, you know, uh, an angiogram, I'm taking all kinds of medications, Xanax, as you mentioned. And it just seems like, it's like even today, dawned on me that like every, every time I go in the kitchen, you'll see where I'm getting with this, uh, getting in, in the kitchen, it triggers me again to have tightness in the chest. So I'm just wondering, you know, is it just psychological, you know, the tightness, because uh, I have had panic attacks in the past. My mom died when I was... A, I had to move out within two weeks. This is like four years ago. So I just want to see your thoughts on that. The tightness in the chest, does that have to do, relate to panic attacks? 40% of everybody who, is, who presents at an ER with chest pains in the United States is having a panic attack and not a heart attack. 40%. 3.1 million people a year out of the 8 million total. Um, that gives you an indication... A, how, look, how real the symptoms feel, right? And in the book, I interview a 911 operator who literally who did this for 17 years and could not tell the difference between a panic attack and a heart attack because the symptoms so closely mimicked each other. So every day in our, right now, as we are sitting here, there have been people at ERs across the country admitted thinking they're dying of a heart attack when in fact they're having a panic attack. Only one to 2% of them are treated for panic and released. The rest are sent home. Most of them, about 60% or a little over 50%, are told it's not a heart attack, but they're not told what it is. So they go home and they stew a little bit more about what this mysterious malady might be. Um, and a bunch of people are sent home just not told anything. Um, so it's very, very sad. But yes, that is the scary thing about a heart attack 
and a panic attack, the symptoms are so very similar. And maybe there's something about cooking or the kitchen that triggers your anxiety that's making you feel chest pain rather than something environmental. Okay, who says is Dr. Gutman, who is not a doctor and not qualified to make any diagnoses, by the way. Okay, wait, who was, uh, okay, no, this guy. This guy was next. Yeah, you do. Who was that guy in the Thank back? You. Thank you for doing this, Matt. Um, I, I've probably had a panic attack maybe twice in my life. Um, I don't suffer from extreme anxiety. Um, though, of course, there have been moments, of course, like all of us, where we've had anxiety. So what advice would you have for folks um, who might have others in their life that do um, for them? What, what types of things do you want when you have an anxiety attack? or um, a panic attack? Like what are the things that you, how do you cope? What do you, would you like your significant other to do, friends to do, those types of things? I think the first is understanding. And I, I, I mean, I know you, Robert, so you are an incredibly understanding and sensitive person. But I think in general, I think uh, just being there for that person and being present and grounding them in any way that you can. But there are a lot of really simple methods, including a mindfulness trick uh, taught to me by someone in this room um, that can help. And, you, you know, we can talk about that later, but there are all sorts of little things that can help in the moment or as someone feels a panic attack coming. Um, and if you want, I can, I can describe a couple afterwards, but... Um, it's basically just being there. Like, I, I actually don't want anybody to mess with me. Like, when it's happening, I want it to happen. I want the adrenaline and then the cortisol to clear my bloodstream. And that takes not more than two minutes. And then I'm okay. I feel a little tired afterwards. I feel a little beat up, like you're through a roller coaster. But, like, I don't want anybody. But I, people may be very different. I don't know. I but think the you most don't want people thing, saying, like, you're fine. Everything's, like... You're making a big deal. Like, you could probably, like, those are the, calm down. Don't tell someone yeah, never to calm say down. calm down. <laughs> Just relax. Yeah. Um, okay, would. so we have. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, what okay. do you do? The question was, what do you tell a family member? How do you interact with someone? It's a very short thing. I, 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 Will I, you use your sorry. microphone? I, you know, I, <laughs> They, the, the idea about panic attacks is not so much the pain. There is, you know, not insignificant. Uh, there's enough discomfort. There's enough discomfort that people mistake it for a heart attack, right? So that's not fun. But what's really debilitating is the fear of having a panic attack. And I don't know if we got to this, but, you know, People can have a panic attack and not have panic disorder. Panic disorder is the chronic appearance of panic attacks over a period of time, and even more so, the fear of having a panic attack. That's what's debilitating. So it moderates your habits, it moderates your lifestyle, and it controls what you do. And that's where people need support. It's not like when they're having a meltdown and struggling. It's all the times that lead up to it. Um, the anticipatory anxiety of having a panic attack. Does that I'm make sense? Take, I'm going to take these And just two. feeling like it's normal. It's okay. Okay. So we have you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, hi. I thank you so much for being here and for your book. It's really quite amazing. Um, um, you said, I felt like you said something really powerful when you said, um, when you talked to your holistic therapist and said that we should be more emotional and feel things more and, and like face, I guess you faced your well of grief. Now, were you, you mentioned the hot ticket items that you do to alleviate your anxiety or things we can do to alleviate your anxiety like running and walking and cutting the coffee and cutting the alcohol. Um, were you doing those things before you went through all of the modalities? And then, yeah, were you doing them before? Excellent question. Uh, no, not really enough. I didn't know about the alcohol so much. I didn't know that it made me anxious. Um, and, and I didn't cut the coffee, no. So it's like some really simple things can help us. Um, do you think that releasing and letting everything 
go. Do you think that releasing and let every, letting it out and sort of facing it, um, I know this is probably in the book and I'm excited to read it, um, but facing the pain made the, the new pieces of information more effective? It's a great question. I don't think it made the new pieces of information effective, but it just helps in general, right? And then once you have the learning about how our bodies are and everybody's individual, right? Caffeine and alcohol may not have the same effects on people or nicotine for that matter. But on me and in most people, they do make them more anxious. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to Ellen Vora, the doctor, the holistic psychiatrist who talks about the need for a cultural rebrand for emotion, but specifically crying. Like You release dopamine when you cry. Is it dopamine or... Cortisol. Cort right. But there are feel-good chemicals as well that are released. Um, and this helps your body just deal with trauma. You don't have to know what it is, but it is helpful. Um, so yeah, I mean... and. There's also something about men in our society, right? We have to be in control. We have to have a deep voice. We have to be muscular. We have to look a certain way. Um, and vulnerability is not, so, even like we're tiptoeing towards it, but we're not quite there yet. But we also need an outlet. Thank you. Okay. I, th I think this is the last question. Um, thank you for your vulnerability. And thank you for your honesty. And thank you for your great reporting. Um, you took the word shame out of shame, and I appreciate that. And my question I have about the, the, the well of grief, and you entered that through your journeys and your medicine. Um, when you felt that you couldn't feel that pain anymore, did that create more panic attacks? Like, for instance, going deeply into that well of grief, that fear of that, you were never going to stop crying. Did that pass... No, I mean, it's a great question. So I, I think the question in case, and, and Susan, just make sure that I got it right. Um, did going into the realm of grief and having these massively cathartic crying episodes, did that actually beget panic? No, it did the opposite. It, I mean, each time I had one of those cathartic cries, um, it just dredged the well. Um, and for a while, the well was... was dry. And then, like a real well, the water seeps up from, you know, the, 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 the porous stone and, and fills up again. But no, it, it's unbelievable how good you feel, or I feel, after having one of those episodes. And it really did wonders for the panic. Um, and I don't know if grief caused panic in me, but certainly that bubbling of pain was not helpful. Um, and so it's, it's all about increments. There is no magic pill, and there's nothing that's going to last forever. If you do ketamine or mushrooms or altered states or one dose of Xanax or Clonopin, it's going to make you feel better. But wellness is work, and it's all about maintenance. And I know that's not cool to say when people want, like, the four-minute makeover and the four-minute body and the four-hour job, but it's work. It's maintenance. And... You know, we just have to constantly keep doing it. I'm happy to take one question if, if Mayim is okay. Okay. All right. One last question. Oh, that means I have to go over and give it to you. Thank you. I'm very excited about reading this. Um, can I ask you about the role of psychotherapy and if that played a part in, or and does it continue to play a part? In Any your... shrinks in the room? <laughs> oh, shocking. <laughs> Um, so I did a lot of psychotherapy growing up and I realized after many years of it that I was gaming my therapists and that as a natural pleaser, I had this relationship that I had to maintain and I was trying to please my therapist and make them like me, which is not useful. Um, and so I'm actually, after many years, I'm back in therapy now, but I had one very specific thing that I wanted to work on after I dealt with this book that sort of came up. And so I think therapy can be very useful. Um, but I think it's sort of issue specific. I, I think it's, 
It's, a, it's an important modality, but I think people can get, certain types of personalities can get into trouble with it or into these lingering, long-lasting relationships that aren't that fruitful after a while. And so uh, I think there are other modalities that are very, very useful and successful in addition to therapy. I hope I didn't upset the therapist in the group. Yeah. Do you understand? <laughs> Daphne Venegay, of course, my wife. One of the things that really bega to, to, uh -oh. to, to began to change things for you was talking to strangers and to share. So in that sense, psychotherapy is exactly that. If there's something that you're not talking about or you're not sure, talking to a stranger or to a professional, but especially to a professional, is extremely useful. Yes, but uh, a therapist is your intimate. It's like you were the first person I told and I still had a secret. And the therapist that I had at the time was another person, or a psychiatrist who was prescribing stuff, was the other person. But it wasn't sharing. It wasn't opening up about the, the things I was going through. It was still this very small group of two people who knew and then my agent eventually. But yeah, I mean, opening up is being like, telling people like, yeah, I suffer panic attacks on air, you're a stranger, I don't know you, you're one of the 10 million people that watch world news, and here's my deepest vulnerability, have at it. Um, I just want to thank Matt, not only for, um, for writing this book, but for talking about it so openly. Congratulations. And, and thank you to Maim, who came out today and did this. Really, thank you. She's so good. You, you both reminded me why I still do writer's block. So it was just so fabulous. Matt is going to sign many copies uh, in the lobby, and I urge you to get a couple each, you know, right? Thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.